Now listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Registrar's office. This is Pam. Yes. Hello. I'm calling about enrolling to study at the university. This is the right number. Yes. This is Mitchford University Admissions. What would you like to know? Well, basically, I need to know what I have to do to be enrolled as a student. You see, I'm currently studying education at another school. I've just finished my first year, but I'm not really enjoying it. I think I'm more interested in accounting. My dad teaches maths, so I thought it might be a good choice. Well, better than business anyway. Okay, okay. Have you received a registration pack? No. How can I get one of those? Well, you've got to have one to register. You can enroll at the university at any time after you receive a registration pack. These are usually available from September for first-year and transferring students, and from November for returning students. On the basis of the information contained in the registration pack, you should attempt to make a firm choice about which courses to study before completing your form. I see. So I've only got a month to get my registration pack in. Can you send me one? Sure. If you are close to a high school, the registration pack and university prospectus are available from the careers advisor. Would that be helpful? Well, the closest school's too far away, and I haven't got a car. Are there any other ways you can send it to me? Well, for prospective students who have already left school, the registration pack and prospectus are available from the university information line. But that might not be of help for you. No, not really. I'll tell you what. Why don't you give me your contact details and I'll send a pack out to you. At least that would be a start. Okay, sounds good. Right. Firstly, what's your name? Richard Dreyfus. That's D R E Y F U S. Your address there, Richard? Unit twelve, fifteen Sportsman Avenue. That's S P O R T S M A N, Mermaid Beach. Four double five four. And your telephone? Yes, I won't give you my home. Mobile's best. O four one four. Hang on a minute. I don't call myself usually.、Uh, I think it's O four one four six five eight three three nine. Yes, that's it. Okay. Now, do you have email? Yes, I do. It's Dreyfus, my last name, at Igo. That's I G O. dot com. All lowercase letters, of course. Now listen carefully and answer questions eight to ten. Okay, that looks fine. Now, do you have any questions for me? Yes, I've got a friend who is interested in studying at the university. I'm not sure what would be best,、uh, the best way for him to register. Can you give me some suggestions? Sure. There are three ways to register. Option one is telephone registration. Before you telephone, fill out the registration form included in your pack. This will ensure you have all the information that you require. The number is in your registration packet. Don't forget to hold on to a copy of your registration form for future reference. Yep.、Yeah, okay. Option two is registration by post. All you have to do there is complete the relevant sections of the registration form and post the completed form together with all documentation required in the envelope provided. All right. The third way is to simply come in. Visit the Student Information Center in the Information Services Building, and your friend will receive personal assistance on how to complete his forms. Thanks very much. You've been most helpful. You're welcome. Good luck with your future studies. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Hello, and thanks everyone for coming here today. I know it's always a bit stressful going for a job interview, but it's best to be prepared. For any of you who may not know me, my name is Fiona Ogilvie, and my job is to offer guidance and support for students with special needs. Now. You wouldn't be here today if you weren't interested in finding a job in the holidays. So let's get down to it and see what things you need to be looking out for. Most of you, I hope, will be applying for jobs with the companies that have been recommended by the university.
The reason for this is that we here at the university already know these companies and have established good working relationships with them. I've also been to visit all of them and checked out the facilities they have to offer. You really need to make informed choices when you're looking for a job, and make sure you know before you even get to the interview stage that your needs will be met. But I know that some of you are applying for jobs independently, and have looked at companies outside the university recommended list. So for you, it's best to plan ahead and be aware of what it is you may need while you're working. Things that you need to check when you go for an interview are. Are there enough toilet facilities, and are these easily accessible? Also, you want to check that all the public areas inside the building are barrier-free, so you can get direct access to these public spaces whenever you need to. And ask about ramps into the building, so you know how many there are and where they are located. These kinds of things are so much more difficult to sort out when you've started work, as they take time. But ramps are an absolute must, so please make sure you know where they are. Another thing you must make sure of is that the lifts have the correct lowered control panels. Ask if all the lifts have this facility, or if it's only certain ones. Now, something I think that is often overlooked is working hours. What you want to make sure of is that you get flexi time. This basically means that your working hours are flexible, and you can clock on and clock off in times that suit you, within reason, of course. Most companies do recognise that it takes much longer for someone in a wheelchair to get on and off buses and trains. Public transport can take that much longer, so you need to be organised and prepared. And for those of you lucky enough to own a car, check how many disability parking spaces are available. Remember that it's your right to have a disabled parking space. These also need to be near enough to a wheelchair accessible entrance or ramp. Okay, are there any questions before we move on? Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Right, let's move on then. Now I want to talk you through the series of visits to companies which we've got planned for next week. On Monday morning, we will be visiting the Lowland Hotel. They have various summer jobs available, working as a receptionist or conference organizer in their busy conference center, organizing and setting up conferences. You need to be prepared for working in an office environment and spending quite a bit of time talking on the telephone. The bus leaves for the hotel at 9 a.m., so make sure you leave yourself plenty of time to get there. When you arrive at the hotel, please gather in the reception area and wait for someone to take you to your first session, which will be a talk. The talk at the hotel will begin at 10 a.m., and then there will be a short tour of the hotel. There will be a light lunch provided, which is usually salads and sandwiches. The next place we'll be visiting will be on Tuesday afternoon. We'll be going to visit a little local company that makes handmade paper and cards. For those of you studying art, this may be just what you're looking for. We'll be taken on a tour of the company, which lasts three hours. The tour will start at 3:30 p.m., and after that, you'll have a chance to meet some of the staff. Tea and coffee will also be provided. We have no trips planned for Wednesday, but on Thursday morning we'll be going to Tobago Travel Agency. This is a very popular choice amongst our students because you can get student discounts on holidays. We've booked a coach for this, and it'll leave from outside the refectory at 8 a.m. You'll need to bring a packed lunch for this, so please don't forget. There is a little canteen where you can buy hot and cold food, but this is closed on Thursdays. Friday, we'll be having representatives from all the companies visiting us, so you will have a chance to ask any questions, and of course, put your name down on the list if you're interested in working for them over the summer. 
This event will take place in the main hall next to the library, and it'll run from 10:30 until 4. I really hope you make the most of this excellent opportunity to not only earn yourself some extra money, but also to gain experience of what it's like to work. And if you'd like to find out more, then please ask some of the students who worked last year. They're all wearing green badges and will be happy to speak to you afterwards. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Professor Pyt, as a young scientist in Antwerp, you were part of the team that discovered the Ebola virus in nineteen seventy-six. Can you tell how did it happen? I still remember. Some day in September, a pilot from Sabina Airlines brought us a shiny blue thermos, and a letter from a doctor in Kinshasa, in what was then Zara in the thermos. He wrote there was a blood sample from a Belgian nun who had recently fallen ill from a mysterious sickness in Yambuku, a remote village in the northern part of the country. He asked us to test the sample for yellow fever. These days, Ebola may only be researched in high-security laboratories. How did you protect yourself back then? We had no idea how dangerous the virus that we were dealing with was, and there were no high-security labs in Belgium back then. We just wore our white lab coats and protective gloves. When we opened the thermos, the ice inside had largely melted, and one of the veils had broken. Blood and glass shards were floating in ice water. We fished the other intact test tube out of the slop and began examining the blood for pathogens using the methods that were standard at the time. But the yellow fever virus apparently had nothing to do with the nun's illness. No, and the test for Lassa fever and typhoid fever were also negative. What then could be? Our hopes were dependent on being able to isolate the virus from the sample. To do so, we injected it into mice and other lab animals. At first, nothing happened for several days. We thought that perhaps the pathogen had been damaged from insufficient refrigeration in the thermos. But then, one animal after the next began to die. We began to realize that the sample contained something quite deadly. But you continued. Other samples from the nun who had just died arrived from Kinshasa. When we were just about able to begin examining the virus under the electron microscope, the World Health Organization entrusted us to send all of our samples to a high security lab in England. But my boss at the time wanted to bring our work to a conclusion, no matter what. He grabbed a vial containing virus material to examine it, but his hand was shaking. And he dropped it on a colleague's foot. The vial shattered. <laughs> My only thought was, "Oh shit!" We immediately disinfected everything, and luckily our colleague was wearing thick leather shoes. Nothing happened to any of us. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. We're finally able to create an image of the virus using the electron microscope. Yes, and our first thought was, "What the hell is that?" The virus that we'd spent so much time searching for was a very big, long, and worm-like. It had no similarities with yellow fever. Rather, it looked like the extremely dangerous Marburg virus, which, like Ebola, causes a hemorrhagic fever. In the 1960s, the virus. Killed several laboratory workers in Marburg, Germany. Were you afraid at that point? I knew almost nothing about the Marburg virus at the time. When I tell my students about it today, they think I must be from the Stone Age. But I actually had to go to the library and look it up in the Atlas of Biology. It was the American Center for Disease Control which determined a short time later that it wasn't the Marburg virus, but a related unknown virus. Hundreds of people had already succumbed to the virus in Yambuku and the area around it. You were also the one who gave the virus its name. Why Ebola? On that day, our team sat together till late into the night. We had a couple of drinks, discussing the question. 
we definitely didn't want to name the new pathogen Yambuku virus because that would have stigmatized the place forever. There was a map hanging on the wall and our American team leader suggested looking at the nearest river and giving the virus its name. It was the Ebola River. So by around three or four in the morning, we had found a name, but the map was small and inaccurate. We only learned later that the nearest river was actually a different one. But Ebola is a nice name, isn't it? Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Now let's turn to shopping, which may interest you more. In general, shops open at 9 o'clock in the morning and close at 5.30 in the afternoon. In country towns and quieter suburbs, smaller shops close for an hour at lunchtime, and once a week there tends to be an early closing day when most shops shut during the afternoon. Many cities have a late night once a week when shops stay open until approximately 8 o'clock in the evening. You should ensure that anything you bring into the country, such as travelling irons, heated rollers, hair dryers and electric shavers, can be used on the standard British voltage, which is 240 volts, 58Z. Many hotels will, on request, be able to supply adapters for electric shavers. When you travel, you may want to send postcards home. Stamps can be bought at post offices throughout Britain. They are open from 9 o'clock to 5.30, Monday to Friday, and until 12.30 on Saturday. Stamps can also be bought at postal centre stamp dispensers, at large stores and major tourist attractions. For posting letters, you don't have to go far before finding a red painted letterbox. Alternatively, use the letterboxes at post offices. You may ask how much to tip in hotels and how much it is for a taxi. There are no fixed rules on tariffs about this and the following is intended only as a guide to customary practice. Most hotel bills include a service charge, usually 10 to 12 percent, but in some larger hotels, 15 percent. Where a service charge is not included, it is customary to divide 10 to 15 percent of the bill among the staff who have given good service. In restaurants, if a service charge is not included in the bill, then 10 to 15 percent is usually left for the waiter. For porters, we usually give 30p to 50p per suitcase. For taxis, 10 to 15 percent of the fare. Hairdressers, two pounds according to how much work they have done, plus 50p to the assistant who washed your hair. If you drive in Britain, you should remember to drive on the left and overtake on the right. The wearing of seat belts is compulsory for the driver and front seat passengers. Now let's talk about full details of Britain's road regulations. A copy of the Highway Code can be obtained from offices of the Automobile Association, AA, or Royal Automobile Club, RAC, at most ports of entry. These two motoring organisations can also provide plenty of helpful information to all motorists. Contact AA. Telephone is 01 854 7373 24 hour service. RAC telephone is 0304 204 256 24 hour service. For something more serious, telephone operators will give you the telephone number and address of a local doctor's surgery. Alternatively, you can go to the casualty department of any general hospital or, in the case of severe emergency, dial 999. 999 is free. Remember, unless you belong to a European community country or one with which the UK has reciprocal health arrangements, you will be charged for the full cost of medical treatment in Britain, except in the case of accidents or emergencies requiring outpatient treatments only. It would therefore be wise to take out full medical insurance before leaving home. You now have half a minute to check your answers.